is the sound of music. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Prime Factors. Prime Factors is the episode in which the crew of Voyager comes across the Pleasure Planet, where people... Uh, no, I'm not talking about Ryza. Where people want them to stay as part of the evil scheme to keep taking care of them. But as part of the thing, they discover a method by which they could get significantly closer to home. And then it doesn't work, and then Taurus gets yelled at, and then Tuvok gets yelled at the end. <laughs> I love doing my little summaries sometimes. Because ultimately, I, what I try to do is I actually try to summarize what I remember about the episode proper. And then I'm like, hmm, that's not much, is it? Let, let me make this absolutely clear. I actually rather enjoy this episode. Uh, Prime Factors is probably one of my favorite season one episodes. And I really enjoy it for two very core reasons, which I'm going to discuss first right off the bat here. One, whenever television in general, especially Star Trek, tries to <laughs> tries to uh, attack something or uh, have a dilemma, they tend to go for extremes. Let me give you an example here really quick here. In this specific episode, if you've seen the episode, you know that the dilemma is basically, do we violate their canon of laws, you know, being on the other side of the Prime Directive, blah, blah, blah. Most of the time, what they will do instead is, let's say that this wonderful planet that is all peaceful and wonderful happens to be populated by uh, a slave race that they have they have bred for, for millennia in order to stand on the backs of, you know, horrible, evil, stuff like that. They tend to go for such extremes most of the time. Now, extremes can be used properly, but when you use it all the time, what you engender is a situation in which you just kind of look at it and kind of roll your eyes because you know what's coming. Whoops. And then you knock over your pad with, your no with all your notes on it. Word. And then your Kleenex. So, I actually rather like that for once, the big villain of the episode was in fact just some hedonists who wanted Voyager because they were the latest thing. I actually really enjoy that, and that really helps prop up the episode, but on top of that, it creates a genuine aspect of uh, tension. And it's weird to mention that in, in regards to an episode which is which has no great villain, which has no major threat, which has no alien ship trying to destroy them, but there's a sense of genuine tension amongst the, the dramatic... Per uh, presentation of the crew in relation to Janeway and her decisions thereof. And I'll talk about that more when I get to my changes, but overall, these two core reasons, you know, the fact that you didn't it, you didn't know it was going to happen, and so there was genuine, you know, intrigue, and the fact that it didn't go to extreme, but it was a very moderate in its approach, both really helped lift this episode up, in my opinion. Now, usually I go through and talk about individual scenes. You'll notice I've kind of stopped doing that lately, partially because it takes forever, but ultimately because most of it is just re rehashing the kind of things I tend to like and dislike. In this episode... Uh, I would have, I wouldn't have made this any given person. Uh, well, okay, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's let's rewind a bit here. In this episode, we do see Harry Kim not exactly acting well. Unfortunately, I I, I cannot say anything kind about that. He seems just as wooden as he tends to be, and I really wish that they hadn't forced that upon him. Again, I am I am taking Garrett Wong at his word on this one, but I have no reason to disbelieve the man. But. I really enjoy the gentleman they picked to play the the head bad guy, basically, the, the, the administrator who, even though ultimately he used the word pleasure way too often, you can get at the point that he is someone who, he, he does a good job of portraying someone who doesn't like to think about the long term, doesn't like to think about the consequences, he doesn't like to think about anything other than the now and what he's enjoying now. He does actually portray, in other words, a rather realistic hedonist. See, hedonism is something that most people, when they portray it, they go to the extremes, like I've said. And while this gentleman is, it, while hedonism itself is an extreme, you would argue, all I have to say is, Chauncey, the chocolate icing. And you know what I mean. Uh, or at least, if you do, you get a cookie, because, my God, I can't believe you, you caught that reference. But, and, I, and no, I can't do the voice. I can't do that voice at all. I'm not even going to try any more than I just did. My point here is that he portrayed it very well. He portrayed someone who was a hedonist, who was believable. Someone who I could actually see having the perspectives that he does, and I really enjoyed that. There's a lot of things that I tend to say in a negative light with regards to track, and one of them is how small it tends to feel. For example, 
In this episode, we see a grand total of one set. Now, that's that's by th there's some ways that you just can't get around it. You know, this is a television show after all. But ultimately, this entire planet is represented by a single set. We see two different angles of it total, really, um, and that's it. This whole planet is represented by a single person and, in occasion, two other people who actually have lines, and that's it. Three members of this alien race have lines. Now, I know. Just, just bear with me, okay? I do understand. I really do. I'm not actually holding that against this episode, or even against Star Trek in general. I understand budget problems. I understand that vision has to take a backseat to budget, as the saying is, as the saying goes. I just lament it, because it would be so much better if we could actually ha actually see rather than be told how the extent of which you know it could actually feel like a planet rather than a sound stage. And I do actually regret that in many ways, because I feel that this wor this episode could have been th fleshed out much more if we saw much more of the the beauty and, and the art and the culture of this massive world, which is basically revolving around hedonism, instead of see this one little white, kind of not really interesting terrain. And now granted, when they go to the other planet within their reach, that was actually pretty cool, I'll admit that. But overall, it just kind of falls flat on its face, and we kind of have to go with it rather than actually be told it by the episode itself. And again, that's not something I'm hoping it's this episode specifically, it's just probably the biggest time it's come up, and it will come up again, of course, because it's Star Trek, because it's television, because everybody has that problem. Even Babylon 5 had that problem to certain extents. But at the same time, I feel like pointing out Babylon 5 got around that by creative use of of communications and and rather than actually having them show this planet you would or, or rather having them some, them beam down because obviously they don't have beaming you know they, they would interact with people on communication they would interact with people on the ships there would be portrayals of, of of backdrops you know things like that in order to flesh out a planet even tng had this thing where they would do these matte paintings very well very well painted very well drawn Rebel designed that would give us an idea of what this planet looked like. Now, of course, they would reuse those uh, on several occasions, which which kind of killed the atmosphere. But I would have liked to at least see something that shows this beautific, wonderful planet with this with this incredible architecture to get across the point that this is what this planet is like. You know, it would have been just a nice touch. I, I hate to sound like I'm complaining or being petty, because overall I do like this episode. But this is a problem Voyager has in general: the the concept of feeling small when it's supposed to feel large. <laughs> Hmm, give me just a second here. I'm, I'm trying to think of how to get to my next point while I type this out. Hmm. I guess the way I want to go with this is... I feel like certain parts of this episode were rushed, uh, partially because they were. Anybody who knows the backstory of this knows that certain changes were being made literally days before shooting, and Tim Russ still wasn't actually uh, satisfied with the end result of that. And it's probably no surprise to you, if you know anything about this episode, that most of the, most of my changes with regards thereto would actually have emphasized the point that Tim Russ had. Uh, I guess I'll go ahead and talk about that now, because I, I really have so little else to say about the episode proper. Uh, except a few... I, I don't want to say a few things. Number one, once again, we did see both Seska and um, Carrie in a, in a good manner. Both of them were being portrayed as good... They were being used well, if you understand what I mean. They were... They weren't just there. They added to the story. From them, we saw we saw Seska, someone who, at the very least we think, is someone who is very dedicated about getting back home in order to keep fighting the good fight against the Cardassians. And I'm sorry, I can't help but laugh when I say that, and if you don't know why, you'll find out soon. But um, portrayed her as the, the troublemaker, the person who was trying to push the envelope. She was still very clearly, as she was in the previous episode, she was an, an instigator. Most of what happened, and as far as the uh, the attempted mutiny, or what, what would be attempted mutiny plot, start, came from her, originated from her. I liked the fact that Carrie went along with it completely, and he himself said it very well. I have a wife and kids back home. Really, that's all he had to say by itself, right there. No other explanation needed. Anybody who out there who has a family understands how powerful a drive it is to get back to that family, to, to try and take care of them. And if you do not feel that way because your family is horrible, then I apologize, but I'm, I'm not trying to be, you know, whatever here. But you get my point. 
by itself, oh, that's, uh, that spoke volumes. And the fact that Carrie and Torres and uh, Seska were all working together on this, this would-be mutiny, mutiny worked really well, in my opinion, and was, uh, again, an excellent way to highlight their characters without actually going too far into it. It also sowed the seeds, in my opinion, for what will be coming up soon, uh, which I will not talk about here in great depth, but it gave us enough of a hint that both Carrie and Seska could both be considered to be rebellious against Janeway, and that was necessary for what would be coming. So, very well done, uh, all things considered. Now, did I enjoy the episode then? Yes, I did, actually, quite a bit. Did I enjoy this episode now? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, again, this is what, argu arguably my favorite season one episode. There's only one other one that is better than this, in my opinion, uh, so I'll, I'll go and say this is my second favorite. But, very well done, a uh, very enjoyable episode, and... Uh, I mean, obviously I could nitpick, but I don't really feel like doing that. I, I'm not a nitpicker, I'm really... I mean, I can be, but I try not to be. Let's talk about changes. Ultimately, I would only change a very little of this episode because of how much I like it and its structure, but there is one big thing that I would uh, put into an underlying theme here. If you've been paying attention, most of the theme I have been portraying and most of the changes I've been doing throughout the series has been increasing this theme of friendship, okay? Within this episode, I would portray Seska and Kiri and Taurus as people who have become friends. They have they have reached the point at now which they have they have grown closer together. Um, I'm sorry, I have to pause for just a second. There is a scene I would basically eject because it's so awkward and uncomfortable. Right at the beginning, Seska and Taurus and are making fun of Harry Kim. The whole scene seems completely unnecessary and doesn't add anything to anybody. And the laughter they give is so fake. And Janeway's over there like, yes, they're making fun of Harry. <laughs> I didn't like that scene at all. I would have just ejected it entirely and replaced it with something else to get across the point I'm getting across now. That these people have bonded to some extent or another. Maybe just show them in the mess hall chatting about something. Something mundane. Something that they share as an interest. Or maybe have them... Uh, one of the, if you've ever worked with engineers or been an engineer of that type, and when I say engineer, I mean that type of mindset, not the specific job. Because anybody out there who knows what I'm talking about knows exactly where I'm coming from here. There is a certain uh, mentality that an engineer has. You know that one of the things they'll do is they'll have very exuberant conversations about a problem, something they want to fix, something they want to work with, and they'll get really into it to the point where they're like, oh, but what, what do we do? How do we just, you know... Uh, I don't want to start spouting nonsense, but you know, how do we fix this problem with that problem? Well, we could do this, but no, I don't think that would work. Maybe if we use this instead, nah, well, okay. You know, have them really do this and show that these people have grown together, grown closer, something along those lines. Now, have Tuvok notice this. That's actually important, in my opinion, because, for reasons I'll get into in a minute. Now, let's go ahead and have them encounter the pleasure planet. Let's go ahead and have them deal with these people. Uh, show more people for God's sakes. Uh, what, that's something I would very much insist upon. We see Harry and Janeway interact with these people. I would have had at least one scene, literally just one scene, that's all it would take, with Chakotay, with Tom, with Balana, with just with Seska. I would have at least one scene where all of them got to see a little bit of their shore leave. Even if it was only a minute or two long, it would have been something to help flesh it out and really show that most of the crew was enjoying their time here. And then I would have the revelation come about the the the, dimen the dimensional shifter thing they they use. I forget what they call it. Doesn't matter. The thing that reflects the planet's core in order to teleport anywhere within forty thousand light years, which is uh, fairly advanced technology. But you know, we'll we'll go ahead and gloss over that because, as we've established, it only works within the confines of this planet. Period. Basically. And so the possibility comes up. Janeway starts asking about it. Things start get hedgy, and somewhere along the line. Seska, again, the instigator, starts mentioning, you know, well, we could make this happen. And as they get further and further into the episode, it would reach a point where they basically decided, we want to make this, this, uh, under, under the, under the table trade, basically. We want to, we want to go ahead and make the trade and try it ourselves, because even if they don't, even if Janeway says no, to heck with her, basically, you know? Now, this is basically what we see in the episode, but I want to add another edge to that. I would want more than just these three people to be a part of it. I would want the, the overall group to slowly grow as the episode goes along. And again, Seska would, would be the instigator of much of these things. Each time they take another step towards what will what will leading to, which I'll get to in a minute, it would be Seska who initiates that step, which is very important. And I would also make it very important, and I would very make, much make the point that Carrie is right there with her, and Balana in this case would be the viewpoint character, the one who's basically being dragged along and, and doesn't know what to do about it. 
you know is trying to be responsible and but at the same time the points they're making are very valid you with me until it would finally reach the point uh, where I would change some of the structure towards the end of the episode where Janeway goes down and talks to the guy and has her little argument and beams up and says we're, we've been asked to leave we're going to leave whatever and you know that's the end of it and they realize that Janeway is about to leave without even trying to make this deal or to try to continue diplomacy because let's be honest with ourselves for a moment one guy saying no doesn't really mean much when it comes down to it yes he's an administrator but on any on a, any government of a planetary level if one guy is saying no it is unlikely that that guy is the only guy who is saying no even if you want to adhere to your principles by the way I want to stress, I'm not even touching the principles thing in this. I don't even want to, because I, I tend to be too much of a pragmatic individual personally to, to look at something like that, even though I, person, I, I do understand the concept of adhering to your principles. Pragmatism, in my opinion, tends to take the, the forefront, so I'm not, I'm not even going to comment on that, the big dilemma about that. Uh, whether or not I would leave it in is debatable. What I would add is more hints to the fact that we don't know if this is this is an absolute if you follow me they actually did mention this in the episode uh you know he may this may be just, no may be a prelude to further conversation as tuvok himself says um at one point they mention just because this other guy is willing to make the deal doesn't mean he is illegitimate if you follow me just because he's going under the this could be basic politics we're talking about here there are so many ways that you could have interpreted this so that it's not a a, a dilemma per se in the sense that do we adhere to their laws as do we know what we're doing with relation to these people if you follow me but moving on so it gets to the point where Janeway has said no she comes back up and at this point Seska pushes everything and Carrie is right there with her Seska I really should say it this properly Seska and Carrie both push for the final step which is genuine all-out mutiny okay now this is going into a little bit of a dark direction but I wouldn't make it the, the really horrific kind of mutiny this would be just a very basic we're not going to leave we have engineering and and much of the engineering crew would be on their side and there would be people across the rest of the ship who are on their side they want to stay and use this technology to get home this is exactly what Janeway had, had said she was all about way back when and to be honest with myself um, later on in the show uh, the episode the void comes to mind Janeway herself would be of that mentality, so this isn't exactly completely out of character. This isn't just me drawing stuff out of nowhere. These people would basically say, no, we're not going to be violent about it, we're not going to overthrow you, Janeway, and you can do whatever you want when we get home, but we're getting home first. And it would be into this situation that Tuvok walked in. See, Tim Russ felt that the true motivation that he wanted uh, to be Tuvok's motivation for making the deal was to prevent this mutiny rather than I wanted to prevent you from ha making a choice you couldn't make, which I feel, and, and Tim Russ said this as well, and I, I agree with him completely, is a much stronger motivation. Because what we have here is a situation where genuine mutiny is a real problem, in my opinion, and that's why I would go in that direction, because it makes lots of sense to me. There are simply too many people on that ship who are not willing to leave just because one guy from one government agency says no. That is not sufficient reason. That is not sufficient cause. And the fact that the captain is willing to abandon everything based on that is mutiny material in my opinion. Thus Tuvok walks in and ba literally says I will make the deal, I will make the exchange and then I'll go talk to the captain. I would have restructured the end a little bit but I would have probably still had them uh, examine examine the item. I, I do have one nitpick about this episode that does actually bother me. The, the dilemma at the end of the episode was completely artificial. I've talked about this before. Janeway says let's leave orbit. Bellana is working on this thing, so she can't let them leave orbit yet. All Bellana would have had to do, literally, wouldn't even had to lie, is say, "Give me one minute, Captain. We're working on, we're working through some things. I'll be back to you shortly." That is all she would have to say, nothing more. And that whole artificial dilemma would have gone away. But instead, she lies, makes up something, and ends up nearly blowing up the ship as the, in the process. Has to shoot the damn device with a phaser, actually completely unnecessary I would have loved to see that ending structured differently such that Janeway's there and, she, and you know Bellana says like I said you know give us just a minute we're working on something and it and the the view stays on at that point stays on Janeway on the bridge as she's sitting there and she's fuming because she is angry at this whole situation and I want I know Mulgrew could do this I know Mulgrew could could portray this she would show her anger not just with the situation with the people on the planet who she is revulsed you know repulsed by who she finds revolting but she would be angry at herself because she feels like she she should be able to do better and she can't quite see it and then 
Tuvok comes onto the bridge, and she turns up, and Tuvok says, Captain, a moment of your time. And then we would have a scene where the two of them discuss the thing, and Jane was like, I can't believe you did that. And Tuvok says, I felt it was the only logical and uh, correct decision, given this. And he gives his reasonings, you know. We were facing an all-out mutiny, and I would rather have tried this under our... Uh, the, the basic logic here, I, I'm going to say this much poorly, more poorly because I'm not actually writing these lines out right now, is if if A is going to happen no matter what, let's make A happen under a circumstance where it's safe and contained and at the very least has some degree of, of control over it, right? Rather than letting A happen heedlessly is regardless of us, at which may cause even further problems along the line. That's basically the way he would present his argument. This this was going to happen one way or another, and he, he felt that it was best that he step in as a representative of her in order to do it on her behalf, so that the crew would be would 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 back off basically. He mentions that Bellana is in the process of testing it right now, and then he argues very very logically that as of this moment the dilemma has passed. They have this item now. Yes, I know some of you out there are going to point out the very thing that I feel Janeway would point out: the idea of dirty data. Uh, this comes to a concept from World War II uh, with regard to Nazi science, and I'm talking about actual Nazi science, the sort of thing that is immoral, but nevertheless did result in, in new information and in, in with regards to medical and, and philosophical technology, that kind of thing. Ugh. Dirty data is the concept that even though it has been done, even though the deed has been done, and what we have now, you know, that has passed, and this is the important part, that has passed, and now we have this new bit of information, that it is still unacceptable to use this information because of where it came from. And that would be the argument Jamie would make. This is a concept of idealism versus pragmatism here, and I personally find my, my own self torn on this, because, and I'll talk about this more when we get to an episode uh, much further in, I can't actually think of the name of it, it's about the doctor and a Cardassian uh, do holographic doctor, it's a very good episode actually. But the idea here is, we already have this device, we're already working on it, why not try and figure out if it can work? And Janeway saying, we just broke their laws, we just helped, assisted them in, in committing something that was horrible. We, we cannot do that. We, even if they feel it is acceptable to lower themselves to that level, we do not feel it is acceptable to lower ourselves to that level. And as the two are having the discussion, Bellana would go ahead and contact Tuvok, and Tuvok would, you know, go ahead, and Bellana would give him the results, that it only works on the planet and it's not going to work. I do this on purpose because it is my opinion that neither of these sides are right or wrong. The, the per two perspectives I just portrayed between Tuvok and Janeway, the pragmatism and the idealism. I don't think either of these are wrong or right, and I would rather have the viewer make up their own mind based on the circumstance, so I wouldn't actually resolve it on purpose. I would have the dilemma taken away because it doesn't work, so it doesn't matter. And then I would have the final scene where Janeway stares at Tuvok and basically says, I, I would not have, I very much would not have the I need you to be on my side thing and have Tuvok admit that his logic was an error because that irritated the hell out of me. I would have Janeway say, if I was back, even despite our friendship, if we were back home, I would send you to the brig right now for what you did. And then this pause. And I would add this because then she would say, I do not have that luxury anymore and I do need my friend at my side. And Tuvok would respond, Captain, I was always on your side. Which really hammers in the point, in my opinion, and also is, par is Janeway partially accepting that pragmatic viewpoint, while at the same time Tuvok is partially accepting that idealistic viewpoint within the confines of this, now, the dilemma of what to do with Tuvok. And so the two would, and we would see in this the, the first real signs of that friendship that we kept being told about between those two characters, and we would see where they would move uh, in, in the future as the two develop. And then, you know, they fly off into the sunset at the end. That's how I would have done it, personally. And uh, I guess I'm done, actually. So, <laughs> I'm going to go and uh, work on some other things. Oh, and I will talk to you guys later.